Jesus is in his last week, the last week before his crucifixion. When he came into Jerusalem on Sunday, we know what happened. It was the triumphal entry. It was the cries of Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Oh, and then on Tuesday, you remember what ha- or Monday, we remember what happened. He went into the, into the temple, and he kind of messed with them. He drove out the money changers and the vendors, and he cleansed the temple is the way that the, the Scripture refers to it. And then by Tuesday, when he went back, the Pharisees were ready for him, and they started questioning him. They started giving him a hard time about all of that in which he was trying to relay to them, and they were prepared with lawyers and Sadducees and Pharisees and all this great stuff to come against him. And now here it is as he is departing the temple, which will be for his last time, he makes an observation. And it says that then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now, the temple was amazing. Herod was a prolific builder. He was out to build this incredible monument to God using five-foot-thick, eight-feet-wide, 40-feet-long stones weighing hundreds of thousands of pounds and, and just, just bringing them into an assembly. And I tell you, it was amazing. When we were there and we saw the temple mounted, we just saw some of the stones that were used to, to reinforce them. And it's like, man, how could they possibly have moved these things just because of the sheer size? But it's interesting because exactly what was said is exactly what took place. This dire prediction that Jesus had talking about how every stone of this magnificent temple would be cast down. Now, the Jews took great stock in the temple. The Jews were all about the temple. The temple was the symbol of God's greatness. So the idea of it being destroyed or being taken down was something that was seen as almost ridiculous, but even scary still. We know that just 40 years later that the historian Josephus wrote of the destruction of the temple in A.D. 70, that it was as if there was never a structure there. So complete was Titus and his men, the Roman soldiers that came through when they toppled the temple walls, seeking and extracting the gold that had seeped in from the fires. They tore every stone down, cast every, threw every stone down. Those stones are still laying there today from the original temple. And it's amazing to think that these words were so clearly spoken and Jesus expressing this. And you have to look and think the disciples must have been blown away. The disciples had to look at this and go, okay, this is a new thought. This magnificent structure, because they were impressed. They were showing, hey, Jesus, look at this. Look at this building and look at this section and look at this part. Isn't this magnificent? He goes, it's all going to get knocked down. So they come to him. And they ask him a question. It says, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, his disciples came to him privately saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? The disciples are coming and asking him questions because they're starting to lose track. They're starting not to be able to understand what Jesus is saying. He's talking about the end of an age. He's talking about his return and his coming. And they know that he's spoken of his death and his crucifixion, but they're still trying to put this whole thing together. You see, the disciples were still looking for an earthly kingdom. They were still trying to figure out how does this all roll into this aspect of Rome being overthrown and Jerusalem being made the superpower? How does this work in our understanding of earthly kingdoms? And yet Jesus wasn't referencing an earthly kingdom. Their perspective was very limited. You see, all they had to see in relationship to what Jesus is saying has to do with what has been revealed thus far, but there is so much more now that they can't comprehend because Jesus is about to start revealing that which is going to happen at the end of the age that we know about. You see, this is the perspective that causes us very often to have difficulty in this section of Scripture. This portion of Scripture is very, very important, but also is seen as sometimes being very difficult because there's two completely different perspectives. The disciples, again, earthly kingdom, that which they can see, that which is in front of them, trying to assimilate this idea that Christ is going to be crucified. How does that factor into the Messiah ushering in a kingdom? 
On the other hand, we have a perspective that doesn't look forward to the Messiah, but looks back to the finished work on Calvary and to the prophecy that has been given to us in God's Word in relationship to that which is going to come in the end times. You guys realize there's no questions for us yet to be answered. It's just a matter of the timing in which all of that which is to take place takes place. We have to be careful, though, as we go through this, that we allow God's Word to remain in context. Context is the clear point of everything that we study God's Word in because it's so easy to move off of this understanding if we don't stay true to Scripture, if we don't let Scripture teach and understand the context in which it's written, we will go places where Scripture doesn't go. And this is where many teachers err. Remember the questions. Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Three very different questions with three very different answers. And Jesus answered them and said, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. So Jesus, before he even starts answering the questions, he sets the context in which their questions and their answers need to take place. They have to take place in that place of truth. He warns against false teachers that will come and deceive many. You know, the enemy has always used deception as a means of confusing and misleading people. We don't have to look hard around the world to recognize and realize how many folks have been greatly deceived by Satan throughout the entire world. The greatest threat, though, that we face, the greatest threat that the church faces doesn't come from outside the church. The greatest threat that we face comes from inside the church. It comes from a mishandling of God's Word. It comes from those who will come declaring the name of Jesus but bring false doctrines or doctrines that are not in alignment with what God's Word says. The best safeguard, and you've heard me say it a hundred times, if not more, the best safeguard against false doctrine is to know what is true doctrine, to know what the Word of God says. If you know what it says, when somebody brings you something outside of that, you'll go, hang on a minute. I remember early on as a, as a Christian that there were things that I was reading and just barely scratching the surface of God's Word. You know, it, it's, it's been 30-some-plus years now of study and, and, and continual preparation for messages and that that has brought me to the point to where I just feel like I've got a little bit of a grip on what this whole thing means, right? But back then, somebody would come to me and they would say something, and I would go, that's not right. I don't know why. I'm going to have to go look it up. But that doesn't sound right. That doesn't sound like the nature and the character of God. It doesn't sound like something that that God would allow for in His Word based on what I know thus far, but not knowing everything. I'm going to go look it up. I'm going to go search for it. I'm going to go find it. But we should have that sense within us that when somebody brings something that's false, it just instantly doesn't feel right. I used to say this, this smell test. It just doesn't pass the test. The JDLR, it just doesn't look right when it comes to that which would be spiritually discernible. In order to do this, we have to know what the Word of God says, but we have to build what we know about what the Word word of God says based on some principles. First off, listen, 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 so important. God's Word is never wrong. Amen? Never wrong. God's Word never changes. God's Word is complete nothing needs to be added to it and god's word endures forever if we start on these simple principles we will have the tools that we need in order to be able to combat false doctrine and not fall into deception he goes on he says and when you hear of wars and rumors of war see that you are not troubled for these things must come to pass but the end is not yet For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines, pestilence, earthquakes in various places. All of these are the beginning of sorrows. Jesus goes on to describe what condition will be as the world starts in this downward spiral towards the end. He said there'll be wars and rumors of wars and global strife and famine and pandemic diseases and natural disasters. And this is all the beginning of sorrows. 
It sounds more like the 5 o'clock news. I mean, that's exactly where we feel like we're living right now. The world has been on a steady decline ever since the fall of man, and yet we've also seen such grace and mercy exhibited by a loving and patient God who is willing to wait and willing to allow man to come to salvation. It says, when these things are happening, then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all the nations for my name's sake, and then many will be offended will be betrayed, will betray one another, and will hate one another. Many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. <coughs> and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. But he who endures to the end shall be saved. Say amen. There's an application here for the disciples, as well as for what we know is specifically written to and for us as we approach these times. First, for the disciples, we recognize that there was only, <laughs> only one that wasn't martyred in death for the sake of Christ. There was only one that did, and it wasn't because they didn't try to kill him. They boiled him in oil, but John was the only one that didn't die a martyr's death. But we also see a clear picture of the current conditions of the world today. And I'm Really happy that at this point in time that we're not seeing Christians killed in this country for their Christian faith yet. But it's a common occurrence throughout the world. I mean, we live in, 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 in really a pristine bubble here in relationship to what happens in this country and many of the things that we experience. But the reality is, is that there are places in the world that to be a Christian, to announce that you're a Christian, to profess that you're a Christian, to not deny your Christianity is a death sentence. And so these things are already occurring. They're already happening. Everywhere we look, we see hatred between the races and the religions. We see lawlessness and a lack of love that is all around. But I sometimes wonder how skewed our perception is in relationship to where we are. How many of you, if I, if, if I said, man, things are really bad, I would get instant, oh, 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 those are really bad. Really bad based on what, though? I mean, what is it that we're using as an assessment in relationship to determine how good or bad things are for us? Is it the economy? Well, the economy right now is good. Or at least that's what they tell us. Well, it depends on which side of the aisle you're on, I guess. Right? But is everybody doing okay when it comes to that stuff? Anybody, anybody here not have enough money to, to live on for the most part? I'm not saying you're overspe- not overspending what you got. I'm saying you got enough. <laughs> Everybody got enough food, clean water, clean clothes. Everybody drove to work or last week and then was able to drive to church today. Wow, we're pretty pampered, aren't we? I mean, so when we talk about when it's bad, you know, this is one of the reasons why I love it when we see these opportunities to take, for, especially for the kids, but I think the adults ought to do it too. Everybody ought to go on a mission trip to a third world country. Everybody ought to go someplace where things are not so good. It was amazing. One of the things that, that, that we've seen translated from south of the border to different places and in, 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 in other places, but also over in, in, in Israel, it was amazing to see how, how there would be this really nice area and then people living in cardboard boxes. And that's the, exa- and, and you got to wonder, you think, you, you just kind of shake your head and you go, wow, that's really bad. I wonder why that's happening. I wonder what the problem is. I wonder how it is that they're in this type of dire situation. And guys, let me tell you what it is. It's a matter of those nations, those countries, those places that have refused and rejected the God that is the creator God are going to eventually find and are going to eventually see catastrophe come to them. Now, I'm not talking about all the people groups. I'm talking about the nations. And you know what? We're headed there. As this nation that was founded as one nation under God, blessed by God and protected by God, continues to move further and further away from that God that blesses and protects, we're headed for trouble. Now, I don't know how bad it's going to get, but it can get really, really bad before the Lord would come back. The things that he's describing in here are the beginnings of the end, not the total end. Now, do I believe that Jesus could come back at any moment, and do I welcome that? Absolutely. Absolutely. He could come back right now before I finish this message. I would be okay with that. But I think that we need to be prepared that things could get a whole lot worse as it pertains to how we would test and our faith would be tested 
in relationship to our obedience to Jesus Christ. And so be prepared. And this gospel, it says in verse 14 of the kingdom, will be preached in all the world as a witness to all nations. And then the end will come. There it is. God in His justice will give all men a chance to repent and be saved because God is not willing that any should perish but that all would come to repentance. And Jesus says that the gospel is going to be preached throughout all of the world and then the end will come. Okay, stay with me. This is interesting. This is an area where there's been some confusion and I believe some serious misunderstanding in relationship to how some have taken this. There are those that take this scripture to mean that as soon as as the gospel is taught or preached in every nation of the world, that Jesus has to come back. I mean, that's what he said. As soon as the gospel is preached, so there are those that have gone out and have set and made it their entire life's mission, their entire priority to teach the gospel in the untaught sections of the world. There's an area that's called the 1040 window, and it's between 10 latitude and 40, and it's this area that spans the entire globe, which is one of the most unchurched, unchristianized areas of the world. And they have focused on the 1040 window with the idea that if we can just translate the gospel into those obscure languages, if we can just get a Bible in, if we can get it over the border, if we can slip into that nation, the minute that that word hits, Jesus is coming back. (sighs) What a great thought. What a great ambition. I believe somewhat a little bit misgiven because then on the other side of that, there's those that are going to say you're never going to get into some of those nations. Some of those nations are so locked down, are so restricted, are so off of Christianity is considered to be not only illegal, but immoral and unethical. It's never going to find its way in there. So the gospel is never going to be taught. So on their side of the, the coin, they think Jesus is never going to be able to come back because the word's not going to go out. I have a problem with thinking that somehow or another God's plan is dependent on us. You you with me? I have a problem with wondering how it is that God is just, man, I really hope that they get to those last three nations. I don't think that that's going to happen. I don't think that's a problem or a concern for him. I think we think that way. Now, I'm not making light of the fact that we shouldn't be evangelizing the entire world and we shouldn't strive to get the word of God and salvation out to everyone that we can possibly touch. That should never be a question. But what we need to understand is whenever we think that God needs us to affect his plan, we've stepped over a line that we don't need to step over. As a matter of fact, in Revelation 14, it tells us that God, prior to the end, is going to send an angel circumnavigating the globe, preaching the gospel. Every single human being that will be on the face of the earth at that point in time will have it. See, God can make it happen any way that he wants to make it happen. We don't need to worry about it. We just need to attend to it and let God figure out the winds in the house. Because, see, all of these things are done because people want to know and answer the question, when? When is Jesus coming back? And so if we can come up with a plan to make it happen, Maybe we can nail it down. Let's see what it says as it goes on. Because Jesus is going to tell us when he's coming back. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who's on a housetop not go down and take anything out of his house and let him who's in a field not go back to get his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days and pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time. No, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake... Those days will be shortened. Here's where we have to hold to a true prophetic timeline in order to clearly understand what Jesus is saying. Jesus is referencing the Great Tribulation, a span of a seven-year period that is going to happen after, listen, that is going to happen after the rapture of the church. Say amen. The great tribulation is going to come after Jesus calls the church out. 
And when the Lord calls the church out, literally what will be left in that last seven-year period is that all hell is going to break loose on planet Earth. And for all of those that still remain, they are going to be living in a time that has never likened been since the beginning. Jesus is referring back to the upheaval, to the times of the calamity that happened in the formation of the world is what these people are going to be living in. And it says that three and a half years into this seven-year period, that the Antichrist is going to enter the temple, which will have been allowed to be rebuilt in Jerusalem, and he's going to demand that the Jews worship him. That's going to happen. That is this abomination of desolation. That is this event that is given to us on a timeline. We know when it is going to take place. Three and a half years into the Great Tribulation period. And what Jesus says is for those of you that are there, specifically the Jews, when you see this happen, run. Run. Run for the mountains. Run for the hill. Now, we also see in Scripture that there's an indication that this place that they would go would be in the, the city of Petra or in the, the area of Petra within the country of Jordan right now, and that there will be protection and that God's people will. But he says, run. Don't even go back to your house. If you're on the roof, jump off the roof and run. If you're in the field, just keep headed in, in a direction away from the city. Don't go back. Don't get your coat. Don't get your clothes. Don't get anything. Hope that you're not pregnant. And if you're nursing a baby, that could be a problem. And then it's interesting, he says, I hope that it's not on the Sabbath because they would have so much trouble. <laughs> we can only go five steps at a time. And then we have to wait a certain period of time. No, just run and get out. And if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or there, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive, if possible, even the elect. See, I have told you beforehand. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he is in the desert, don't go out. Or look, he is in the inner rooms, do not believe it. In the time of the great tribulation, there's going to be an unholy trinity. Satan, the Antichrist, and a false prophet will be moving in circles in order to be able to provide great miracles and to wow and to, and, and to be able to deceive even God's elect, even the chosen people of Israel. And Jesus is so clearly saying, he says, when you see this, because see, here's the thing that we've got to understand. He's talking to them knowing that the Jews are going to miss him. They're going to miss their Messiah. They're going to still be looking for the Messiah at the point in time when this abomination of desolation takes place three and a half years into the Great Tribulation period. And he says, at that point in time, there's going to be people that say, the Messiah has arrived. The Christ is here. They're going to point to the Antichrist. He's the Messiah. And he says, don't buy it. Don't listen. There is not going to be another Christ because the one Christ is me. And I'm not going to be there, so don't believe any words about any new or additional Christ that may be available at that time. Instead, you flee. For as lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also the coming of the Son of Man will be. For whenever the carcass, wherever the carcass is, there are eagles will be gathered together. Immediately after this, the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the heaven. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Jesus describes the abomination of desolation. He describes what's going to happen in the temple and the, as the Antichrist sets himself up for worship. And then he says, but my return is going to come in an instant. When I come back, the trumpet's going to sound, the sky's going to split, and we're going to see him coming in on the clouds. Oh, no, no, let me rephrase that. They will see him coming in on the clouds. You know why? Because we're coming with him. We're going to be riding with him. Now, at that point in time, instead of entering Jerusalem on a donkey, he's going to be on a white horse. And I've told you this before. I don't ride horses. I have never been able to sit on a horse and make it work. So I know that God is going to fix that. Okay? 
I no, 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 I'm not talking about a Harley. I'm just saying he'll fix it to where I'll be able to ride a horse. It's got like a heavenly blanket or pad underneath that seat. Something's going to happen there. And he will send his angels with a great shout of a trumpet. And they will gather his elect from the four winds. One, or from one end of heaven to the other. All right, so we're going to make this really, really easy. Some of you may be aware of this, some of you are not, so I'm not going to overwork it. But we need to understand that this verse has been applied very often out of context. When it's applied out of context, it's the verse that many will use to build an argument that the church is going to go through the Great Tribulation period. There are those that claim that this reference here of the elect of God refers to the church as if the church has somehow replaced Israel. Okay? Not so. We need to understand that the gathering of the elect takes place at the return of Christ. So in their mind, if this gathering takes place and the elect are the church, then the church must be on earth during the Great Tribulation period. That's where we get mid-tribbers and post-tribbers. All right? And, and I've always said, I'm not going to argue with them over what I see in Scripture. I'm not going to argue with them with the fact that I believe that we will be out of here prior to the tribulation period. If they want to stay, they can. I'm leaving. When Jesus calls and says, come up here, I'm going. Okay? It's interesting, though, because we need to be careful how we would use this in identifying who his elect all right, now, Revelation provides the correct understanding. In Revelation 4, we know that we see the rapture of the church. Revelation 4 says, After these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you the things that must take place after this. And we know that this is in line with Scripture, with everything that we see when when the apostle was pulled up into heaven that this is a picture of what is happening in heaven at the time before Christ's return. We know there's a timeline. We know that this all works in this way. And then in chapter 5, John is given this view of what's happening in heaven before Jesus returns. Everybody with me? Everybody go like this. If you don't with me, go like this and I'll keep talking. Okay. All right. Look at verse 5 or chapter 5 and verse 8 of Revelation, and it says, Now, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb, each having a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Now look at verse 9. And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by the blood of out of every tribe and every tongue, every people and every nation, and have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. Now, here's why the church cannot be on earth when Jesus comes back. Because before Jesus comes back, there are people singing in heaven about the redemption that came through the blood of Jesus Christ, and the only people that can sing that song is us, those that have been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. We're the only ones that can sing that song. There isn't anybody else in heaven that can sing the song that we have been saved by the blood, and so in order for that song to be sung, the church has to be in heaven at that particular point in time. Amen? I like that. I love that. I'm very comforted by that. Now, we have just covered probably a semester's worth of information in like six minutes. So I want to encourage you, if you still are really concerned or you want to know more about this, go up and listen to the teachings that we've done through Revelation where it is completely explained. The timeline is broken down. Everything is there. But what we need to understand without hesitation is that the the Reference to his elect in this scripture is Israel. It's Israel. That's what we need to know. His elect is no one else other than Israel. And we'll see how that plays out in just a moment. Now, Jesus moves into a parable in verse 32. He says, Now learn the parable of the fig tree. When its branches have already become tender and put forth leaves, you know that summer is near. So you also, when you see all these things know that it is near at the doors. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will no means pass away until 
These things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. This is another verse that has created... Hello? Sorry, Lord. I think my battery is dying or just died. Huh? Okay. It's another verse that has created created a lot of confusion amongst Christians. And again, we could spend a lot of time on this. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna move through it. And and there's there's multiple and 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 plenty of other places to be able to look at this. I want to keep it simple. There are those who interpret this parable of the fig tree to be a representation of Israel. Now, the interpretation holds a lot of merit because Israel is often referred to in Scripture as a fig tree. It's symbolized in that. So there's no problem with that. What some have done, though, is tied this reference in direct correlation to Israel and when they were reborn as a nation. That was 1948. There was also an event that took place in 1967 after a unifying war in which Israel, for the first time since the Babylonian captivity, became self-governed again. All of that in itself is is miraculous and can only be accomplished by the hand of God and His protection. No other people group has ever been decimated the way that the Jews were and came back to not only secure and have a nation, but then to become self-ruled and, ident- and, and hold on to their identity. So all of that is amazing. But the problem comes into play when you add this verse and you assign it a meaning that it doesn't necessarily say. In verse 34, it says, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away until these things take place take place so here's the difficult part if one or the other of these two events what happened in 1948 or what happened in 1967 is drawn out as being this fig tree that is blooming that is coming into leaf that is coming into summer and you say that this generation that sees that will not pass away before the lord returns you have just now constricted Christ's return to a 35-year period. Everybody with me? Okay. I mean, you've nailed it down. Now, again, why do people want to do this? Why do people want to take that verse and try to get it to say something that it doesn't say? Because they want to know. They want to know when Jesus is coming. This is the question that the apostles started out. When is this going to happen? And people have been asking that same question. When is Jesus coming back? When is Jesus coming? I want to know when Jesus is coming back. I think we want to know because the day before he comes, we'll clean up our act. (laughs) But we want to know. But there's a problem with this that is now more evident than it was prior to 1983. Because if you do the math from 1946 and you add 35 years, you come up to 1983. Okay, before 1983, there were a lot of people that thought Jesus was coming back in 1983. And then 1983 came and went. Well, then they said, well, okay, it wasn't when Israel went back into the land. It was 1967 when the unifying war happened. So now Jesus is going to come back in what? 2002. Well, what happened in 2003? Well, a generation must be longer than 35 years. Stop trying to stretch the Scripture into some place that it doesn't go. And those that were many of them well-intended were trying to... How many of you remember seeing the signs? How many of you are old enough to remember the prediction of the end of the world in 1983? Yeah. And in 202. In my lifetime, there's been dozens of them. Right? Then we were going to... It was all going to go by the wayside in 2000. Yawn 2K. <laughs> then there was the whole, the Mayan calendar is running out! What happened? Nothing. <coughs> now we got the global whiners. The climate changers, changers telling us the entire world is going to cease to exist in 12 years if we don't stop driving our cars. How many times can the world end? Just once. Just once. One of the reasons that I am absolutely so confident that we don't know and won't know and can't figure out and aren't supposed to is what comes in 36. Look at verse 36. But of that day and hour, no one knows. 
not any of the, the angels of heaven, but my Father only. Jesus doesn't even know, according to what he says. Only my Father. What I do know, Jesus is coming back. He's coming back. And when he comes back, he'll make everything right. Now, what we need to realize is that in order for that to happen, there are things that we should be attending to in the meantime. Look at verse 37. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as the days before the flood they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and did not know until the flood came and took them all away, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, and one will be taken and the other left. How many of you remember the song from the early days of the Christian movement i wish they'd all been ready great song two men walking up a hill one disappears and one's left standing still i wish we'd all been ready right great song talked about it laid it out completely this whole idea that there will be those who have prepared those that are standing in the place of righteousness because of the covering of jesus christ and those that are not but it references to and it goes back to this whole aspect of what was happening in the time of noah guys Nothing has changed in the way that man views salvation. Nothing's changed. Noah and his family was saved because they what? They believed God. And they believed Him a lot. It took a long time to build that big boat. A lot of ridicule. The world thought he was crazy. A flood in the desert. Right. It says that they were going along just fine. Until it started raining. Until the flood came. And I find it really interesting that the world and those that are in it are very, very readily willing to accept the end of the world. I mean, they are. We have a group that comes around every 10 to 12 years and predicts the newest outcome, the, 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 the next thing that's going to basically wipe out planet Earth. We have people that are stumping on a political campaign right now that are campaigning on the fact that in 12 years that, 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 that humanity is going to cease to exist unless we all jump on board with a new green deal. Let me tell you how long humanity is going to exist. Right up until the time that God puts in play His deal. Not a minute less, not a minute more. And we will do nothing to affect it. But yet it's those very people that want to talk about planning and want to talk about saving and want to talk about making changes to that which they know is inevitable. At some point in time, things are going to stop, but they won't attribute it to where it's coming from. They want to attribute it to SUVs and not the wrath of God. They want to contribute it to the burning of fuels and to, to global warming and to all of this climate change stuff rather than saying the problem is, is that the world is filling full of sin and at a certain point in time, God is going to say enough and he's going to put an end to it. And it will happen at an, in an instant. What will happen first is those that have prepared, those that are waiting, those that have acknowledged will go to be with the Lord. I like that. And then it's going to be really a mess. But you know what's interesting about this and what's really crazy is I can see in the scheme of things, you know, and, 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 and I kind of watch because, you know, 50 years ago, it was hard for our parents to see how all of the things given to us in the book of Revelation could happen. A hundred years, nearly impossible. How in the world could they ever control all of the commerce? I mean, how in the world could they, could they ever do that? How can they make it to where you have to have a number and, 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 and a barcode or whatever in order to be able to buy and sell? How in the world could there ever be communication that would allow people all over the world to be able to see an event at the same time in real time? That's ridiculous. No, that's our modern day in which we live. As a matter of fact, we're seeing way more than we want to. And as far as having a number tied to everything... I went to cash a check the other day. Simple little check. Just, just, just looking to cash a check. There was a third-party check. Went into the bank. The bank was not able to cash my check. 
their computer was down. <laughs> How many of you have driven by the, the, the Bank of America on, on, on William Street? You know that mobile truck that's sitting? That's the bank. That's the only bank that works here. That big building, pff, you could blow it up, nobody would care. They can't cash a $200 check. You got to go to the truck. It must have been out of gas. They couldn't cash it there either. And we don't realize sometimes just how fragile. That was the concern back on, 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 on September 11th when, when the Twin Towers came down and all of that happened. You remember everything shut down? Airlines, banks, everything, everything just stopped. Somebody just went and went, turn the switch off. Nothing was happening. Do you really realize that all of the commerce in this world, that everything that goes in, every dollar that you think you own, every dollar that is there by, by ink but not by backup and substantiation, is subject to the flip of a switch, as is everything else in our life. Our records, our identities, everything is tied to ones and zeros. And now I know there's some of you, no, not me, man, I'm off grid. No, yes, you aren't. And if you want to be, go ahead. And I get it, but the reality is, is that that's the world in which we live, and everything that we do is tied to a number. It's tied to something. And if you don't have a number, you ain't getting nothing. So as far as how can this happen? Easy. I, you know that my mind is a scary thing. I have some really strange thoughts. I mean, I, I do. I, I have some strange thoughts. And, and I was sitting, I was pondering this, and I'm thinking, okay, I can see it now. When the Christians are raptured, it will be because of climate change. <laughs> It'll be the ultimate example of the disaster that has been brought about by mankind. And the planet will have rejected those who didn't believe in climate change. And those that are left will buy it. And they'll sign up for it. Because it's the only way they're going to be able to eat. It's the only way they're going to be able to leave their lights on. It's the only way that they're going to be able to sustain. Because the government at that point in time will rush in and it will solve all of the problems. And everybody will have a number. And if you have a number, then you'll be able to buy and sell. And if you don't have a number, you'll be marked for extinction. It's no mystery. It's no, how are they going to do that? Simple. It's not, it's not a stretch. The technology is there. The desire is there. The mindset that will accept it is there and growing. It's there and growing. Watch, therefore, for you do not know what hour the Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not allowed the house to be broken into. Therefore, you also be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. It says that we're supposed to watch and we're supposed to be ready at all times for the Lord's return. Being ready for the Lord's return means, meaning, means being those who have firmly placed our faith in Jesus Christ. You see, that's how we're ready. This isn't a warning saying, okay, be afraid of the fact that this is going to happen. See, as Christians, we should have absolutely no fear of the end of the world. We should have no fear that everything is going to wind down. Now, it doesn't mean it's going to be pleasant. It doesn't mean that everything is going to be bubble gum and, and, and rainbows. It doesn't mean it's going to be great. But what it does mean is that we should have absolutely no fear because, first off, Jesus has told us that these things are going to happen. The one that can, the one that has the ability to be able to tell us how things have been are and will be, has told us that this is what's going to take place. So we shouldn't have any problem acknowledging it and understanding it. The question is, what do we do in the meantime? And he says, be careful, watch, pay attention. How do we pay attention? Well, we pay attention to our relationship with the Lord. We pay attention to our relationship and our understanding with those that are around us. We continue to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. We continue to do that in faith, by faith, that draws us closer to him so that it, as that particular moment hits, it won't be a surprise at all. I, you know, I, 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 again, my mind goes in these crazy places. I mean, I'm thinking about that, that ride up in the rapture, right? You know, there's going to be some that are going to make it but won't be expecting it. And it's going to be like, ah! I'm going to be like, yeah! 
I mean, we need to be so ready to just take off at any moment. We need to just have this great expectation that the Lord can call us out of here at any instant and have this incredible sense of expectation and joy in waiting for it. And the waiting doesn't mean that, okay, now that we know our ticket is punching and we got a ride, that we stop working. No, we continue to try to get as many to go with us as we possibly can. Who then is faithful and wise? Which servant? It's a servant whom his master made ruler over his household to give them food in due season. Blessed is that Caesar's servant whom his master, when he comes, will find him doing so. Assuredly, I say that he will make him ruler over all his goods. I love that. The faithful and the wise servant is the one that is doing what Jesus has told us to do while we wait for him to return. What has he told us to do? He's told us to abide in him. He's told us to make disciples. He's told us to preach to all of the world the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he's told us to stand by and to watch and to wait and to be prepared. But if that evil servant says in his heart, my master is delaying his coming, and he begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with the drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he is not looking for him and at an hour when he is not aware of. And he will cut him in two and appoint him a portion with the hypocrites. There shall be the weeping and the gnashing of teeth. My prayer is that we would be faithful and wise servants. That we would be ready, that we would be with great expectation looking for the Lord's return. Looking for that opportunity to see the clouds split and Jesus to call us out. And then I can't wait and, 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 and it's so exciting, and I think that, that, that it's going to be literally an instant because at that point in time, time is going to be no more. You see, those that are on the planet are going to be going through a seven-year period of tribulation. I think that our time with the Lord and the presence of the Lord is, is, is going to be just, just nothing to frame by the context and the way that we look at time today. What I find is that I always have less time than I need unless I'm waiting on something. but then we're going to come back as the wise and the good servants. Those that will rule and reign because he will put us in charge of the things that he now has taken possession of. Amen?